So the inverse of little f and inverse of big F like I did here for 26 different distribution functions, <laughs> which is more than you'll ever need or want, okay? So I think we have a c maybe about a week and a half, then we'll, I'll start trying to, I'll start show you how to do with this all, all these calculations in MATLAB, but for now we're doing it all analytically. Okay. Okay, so here's a problem I made up for fun. I love thin films, obviously. So I said, what's the, pro the probability of obtaining a thin film of a certain thickness is governed by this probability distribution. So X is the thickness, okay? And F of X is the corresponding probability of that thickness, okay? So the uh, probability, sorry, the variable X is in microns. And so if we look at this function, this could be, you know, this only has values, I'm, I'm saying between zero and one. And if it's more than one micron, I'm assuming with this function, there's no chance of that occurring. Okay? All right. So you notice I, I didn't specify C here because I didn't know what C's value should be. So rather than just specify it and pretend like I'm clairvoyant, I'm showing you how you actually find C. So I chose this function, no problem, because I wanted um, something that had a certain shape, which I think I'll show you if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Um, so now I need to find the C. So I need to find the C such that the area has, you know, the area under the curve, the integral of this function from plus, minus infinity to plus infinity is equal to one. Okay. So that's all I'm doing here. Plug in the function here, integrate this function from minus infinity to plus infinity. That's equivalent to doing zero to one, right? Because it's only non-zero, zero to one. And so if you integrate this function between zero and one, you'll, something seems, oh yeah, sorry. I need, <laughs> I need this integral to be equal to one, okay? So in this case, I've actually explicitly done the integration. Hopefully you know that if you integrate something that looks like x, you'll get like x squared over two, and if you integrate something that looks like minus x squared, you'll get like a minus x cubed over three, right? You have the two limits of one and zero. You substitute them in when it's all said and done, Everyone knows what to do now. I mean, this is like freshman calculus, right? Or even high school, maybe. Evaluate the two limits. You'll end up with this. You simplify what's in the middle here. Obviously, this has no contribution at zero, only at one. Those are those two terms. That ends up being C over six. And so you can compute that C should be six, right? So if you have C six, you integrate this, you're going to get an area of one. All right, good. Okay, so now I'm interested in the cumulative probability function. So to do this, I need to integrate this function right here. So I want to know the cumulative distribution function. I have the probability function, so I'm going to integrate that from minus infinity to plus. In that's, that's a typo. Sorry. That should be, that should be at little x right there, right? That, if I do it from plus minus infinity, I know it's equal 1. <laughs> I just did that. So to get the cumulative function, I need to have the upper limit be x. Now last semester, I would go in real time and change the slide, and then I had some, some student that said, that's the most annoying, disrespectful thing a professor's ever done. So I'm like, well, I'm never doing that again. So um, <laughs> I'll correct these later, all right? I don't want to antagonize you by going down there and correcting them now. But that should be x right there. All right. Um, so if we perform this integration between 0 and x, knowing the value c is equal to 6, which we just computed, you get this right here. So just to recapitulate, here is the probability function, and here is the cumulative distribution function. Okay. Again, if x is less than 0, this is going to be 0, and if x is greater than 1, it's going to be 1, right? I didn't write that, but that's the implication. So, like you're not to evaluate this at two, right? If you get two, you'll get something other than zero, but that's not what I mean, so I'll be explicit here. So what I really mean here is that, that it's equal to zero if x is, um, well, let's say less than zero, it equals that, that thing I just computed there. I don't want to write it. You see it up there? That thing? All right, I'll write it. Yeah. 
And this is true if, oh sorry, x is between 0 and 1, and then it's equal to 1 if x is greater than 1. Right? That's, that's what I mean. I mean, if you don't write that, then you could substitute in, like, what is the probability this thing is 2 or less, and you'll get something greater than 1. So that's, this is what I mean. All right. And so you can ask the question again, what is the probability that um, my thin film will be 0.5 microns or less? Okay. Well, you might be interested in this because having a, this is not probably strictly true, but having a thin f film too thin is not a problem, but having it too thick is. So you want to know what's the probability it's going to be 0.5 microns or less because that's maybe what you want or maybe what you don't want. I don't know. So to do this, you just have to evaluate the pr this uh, cumulative distribution function at 0.5, and if you do this, you'll get 50%. Not surprising, given the function I chose. All right? Okay, then I couldn't resist doing MATLAB. I try not to do MATLAB outside the MATLAB sessions, but I couldn't help myself. So it was just another example of, I don't think I'll do actually do it in MATLAB, but um, I think everyone will know what I'm doing. I just want to plot this function to see what it looks like, okay? Obviously, I can plot things better than I can draw them. So, obviously, I was only interested in the domain 0 to 1, because below 0, it's 0, right? And above 1, it's 1, so I don't care. So I took, I pr made a lot of x values between 0 and 1. You should know at this point, this creates a vector with a lower limit of 0, an upper limit of 1, and separated by 0.01, so 101 elements. And then I do a scalar I evaluate this in a scalar way, so I get 101 corresponding values of y. We, we've done this several times now. Then I plot x versus y and I label. And I got overzealous here, and I put ginormous fonts on the labels here. Because MATLAB always makes these tiny fonts, but it didn't help with the, right? It helped with the labels, but not with the scale. <laughs> All right. But anyway, so that's what that function looks like, right? And then below that, 0. Above that, keeps going at 1. Okay. So, when you guys I know um, have worked with data or things before, and everyone knows what the mean is, right? So we've already talked about this. Like if you're given a set of samples, so I give you a set of samples. This is the same variable multiplied, multi uh, measured multiple times. Then we talk about the mean as being, right, the average of this computed with this formula right there. Everyone knows that. And then we talk about the variance or standard deviation. That's computed with this formula. That doesn't really matter, but, um, right? Mean and variance. If you take the square root of this, in other words, S is the standard deviation. Okay, so it's important to understand this is, this is the, your estimate of what the mean and variance are from a finite number of samples, okay? It's not the true mean, and it's not the true variance. Unless you get an infinite number of samples, right? If you get an infinite number of samples, you'll find the true mean and the true variance. So what, the reason I write this is because what I'm talking about on this slide is what the true mean and the true variance are. To know the true mean and true variance, you need to know the f function. If you have the probability function, you can calculate the true mean and the true variance of, the, of that particular random variable, okay? So, and they're given different names. You see mu? So in this class, mu means the true mean, and sigma squared is the true variance. These are estimates from samples. We call this the sample mean and the sample variance. They're not the same thing, okay? So if I have this function f in hand, and let's do this because we were just talking about it, and it's a continuous distribution function, then the way I calculate the mean is to take the function f, multiply it by x, and integrate that function from minus infinity to plus infinity, okay? That's the true mean of the distribution. 
If I have the true mean, because I've done this calculation, then I can calculate the true variance. I do that by taking the, val the x, subtracting off the mean, squaring that, and then multiplying that times f and integrating that. That'll be the true variance, okay? The, so the point I'm trying to make is twofold. One is they're underlying or associated with a distribution function are things that you probably heard of more commonly like the mean and variance and the, this is the actual mean, this is the actual variance. Those are estimates, okay? And the whole idea behind statistics you might imagine is that these estimates get better if you get more samples, okay? And so, you know, statistics wouldn't be very useful if, if, if somebody said, you know what, these will get better if you get more samples. Go get more samples, right? That's not the way the real world works. So what we want to do eventually is say, how confident are we that that mean is equal to that mean there? You get what I mean? So if, somebody, if you wanted to be 100% confident that that mean was the true one, you need an infinite number of samples. That's just the way it works, okay? So we're going to start to ask the question, what, how can we calculate with the probability that we're confident, like we're 95% confident this is true, okay? So that's how you deal with, you understand, a finite number of samples. You have to give up absolutes, you have to deal with confidence levels and probabilities and things like this. So we'll come, we'll come back to that. So this is true mean and true variance. So I did this first since we just did the continuous case, and I always like the continuous case better. But if you had a discrete distribution, it would be very similar. You multiply f times x, and instead of integrating, you sum. Okay, because you can't integrate discrete things, you have to add them. And same thing for the variance. Take the value x, subtract off the mu, square it, multiply that times the, the probability function, and sum. Okay? All right. So again, you'll have to become familiar or comfortable and familiar that when I say mu, I mean the true mean, and when I say sigma, I mean the true variance. Usually they're not known. <laughs> right? If they were known, you wouldn't do this. It'd be stupid. You just go, there's the true mean. Don't worry about this, okay? So, um, we're going to want to characterize at some point, like I mentioned, how good of estimates these are of the true mean and true variance without knowing what they are, right? That's the challenge, All right? So, if someone tells you a uh, distribution is symmetric, it means, I mean, everyone know, has a good idea what symmetry means. See that, what I tried to draw that? I was trying to draw a symmetric function. That means there's the same amount of area and the same shape on the left of the midpoint as there is on the right, okay? Mathematically, it says this. If, if you take a function f of x and you evaluate this at c minus x and you, you evaluate c plus x and they're equal, the function's symmetric about c, okay? And most functions we're interested in are going to be symmetric about the mean. Like that's supposed to be symmetric about the mean. Okay, yeah? Would a continuous distribution uh, imply information about future occurrences? No. <laughs> I mean, well, you can calculate, it doesn't matter if it's continuous or discrete, you can predict the likelihood of something occurring in the future okay. with some confidence, right, some probability. It's kind of like if you roll a dice, no one can say it's going to be a three, but I can tell you it's one six probability will be a three. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, so if we go back to um, the function that I had here, for example, um, this, this distribution is going to be symmetric about zero, right? So if you were to plot this function about zero, I mean, if you plot this function and looked at, you'd see it's symmetric about zero. Looks identical, the mirror reflection on the right. Yeah, yeah, so. If, yeah, so if we looked at this, if we were to plot it, you'd see that the, the, the highest probability, which also ends up being the mean, which I haven't shown you, but it is, is going to be x equals zero, right? I mean, if, if a, let's put it this way, if, if a distribution is symmetric about c, okay, so that means um, it looks the same on the, l the mirror reflection of the distribution on the left is the right. It's guaranteed that C is equal to the mean, right? Because if you find the average value, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be C, okay? All right, so 
Three more slides. I'm getting out of here early because I need coffee. That's good. All right. Okay, so when people talk about, you'll see this nomenclature when people talk about statistics, okay? And so I've already told you this, okay? I've told you, if you want to find the true mean, take the density function, the probability function, multiply it times x, integrate it from minus infinity to infinity, and that's the mean, okay? People will also use this notation. This is called the expectation. So if someone said, what's your expectation of the random variable x? You'd say the mean. It's like what I expect it to be. It's the most likely thing. It's, it's, you know, if, someone, if someone asks you, what do you think the most likely value for x will be? You, you, it, the mean. <laughs> okay. So people will often use, we don't use it a lot in this class, so I'm not going to emphasize it. I just want to mention it because it's, the book uses it a little bit and statistics use it a lot. It's called the expectation operator. Someone, so if someone says this, sorry, this is their expectation of what they think the random variable will be. The way to think about it is, what do you, th what do you think the most likely value it's going to assume is? And the answer is the mean. Okay? <coughs> Same thing here. Okay? So this is how we calculate the true variance. Take the distribution function, multiply it times x minus mu, square it, integrate it. That's the true variance. Again, to do that, you need to know the function f. For most problems of practical interest, you never will know f, but there still is a true mean and a true variance. You just don't know what it is, typically. So this would be our expectation of what we think the variance would be. That's what this means. Okay. So again, we're not going to use this expectation operator a lot, but you will see it. It just says, s someone says, what do you think the variance is going to be? You would say this. Okay. So that's fine. Um, so it, with distributions, um, there's things called moments. So, if, so this is a distribution. This is true for any distribution. It doesn't have to be a probability distribution. It could be a distribution of particle sizes. You, you guys know what a particle is, right? You know when you make a particle, you know what monodispersed means? It means you can make a particle exactly the same size. Nobody can do that. <laughs> okay. So when you make particles, they usually dis they're, not, they're polydispersed, meaning they have different sizes, not exactly the same. And when you can measure, you can measure the, the size of particles with a particle size analyzer, and you'll get something called the particle size distribution. So there's all kinds of distri different, different distribu distributions in biology and chemical engineering and materials and things like that. So I'm just mentioning this statement here about moments. This applies to any distribution, not just probability distribution, but since that's what we're talking about, we'll focus on that. So you can calculate, there's something called the kth moment of a distribution. So to calculate the kth moment, you take the function, the probability function, multiply it by x to the k. k is an integer, 1, 2, 3, 4, okay. Integrate that from minus infinity to infinity, and that is called the kth moment. The mean, obviously, is the first moment of the distribution, right? If you look at that, that's our definition of mean. And then you look at that. You'll say they're identical if k is 1, okay? So sometimes people will say, the you know, the first moment, that's, that means the mean, okay? The mean tells you something about the average value, right? That's why we're interested in it. So equivalently, you could have something called the kth central moment. The reason I call it central moment is because you don't just multiply by this thing and then integrate, right? You subtract off the mean. That's what makes it central. That's why they call it central. So you take x, subtract off mu, raise it to the k power, multiply by f, integrate that thing. That's called the kth central moment. Clearly, the thing we're calculating here called the variance is the second, right? Because k is 2, the second central moment of the distribution. OK? All right. So you might say, well, so what? Um, I already knew this, and I didn't, need to, I didn't need to know this. So for some distributions that are more complex, you're interested in higher order moments of the distribution. So this will be really challenging for me. Because the thing is, I can't draw a symmetric distribution when I want to, but now I want to draw one that's not symmetric, and I predict it'll be exactly symmetric. OK. But let's see what I can do. OK, here's my attempt. So here's a function f of x, and here's the x. And then I'm going to try to draw a function that's uniquely not symmetric. Okay, I think I've accomplished it. 
I hope you would agree that that's not a symmetric looking function, right? Okay. So somehow, sometimes you'd like a measure of how asymmetric this thing is, okay? And this is outside the domain I'm talking about, but it's fun anyway. We've got to have some fun. This is my idea of fun, okay? So that measure of how asymmetric is this thing, people call it, is called something called the skewness of the distribution. And that's calculated with the third moment of the distribution. I'll say no more than that. So these, when you, so in statistics with probability functions, you'll see this terminology of expectations and moments. And I just wanted to take one slide so that you would know what it meant. Okay. I'm saying more generally, if you have um, probability functions like this or, or particle size distribution functions or things like this, um, a lot of these same concepts apply. So I think the things at the bottom, right, I've already, this is an important point that people get confused on. So if you want, and I, this is like the 12th time I said it, I think, if you want to know the true mean and the true variance, one must have the probability function and you must calculate it like that, okay? If you do not have the true distribution, which you usually don't, right? and you want to calculate the mean and the variance, you do this from samples, a finite number of samples like this. And this is called the sample mean and sample variance, and they're not, they're not the same. All right. Okay, so here's two more slides, a couple more examples here. Um, okay, so all I'm doing is, so this is the function we had before, right? That's the probability function there, f of x. And so now I'm just going to illustrate how, if one has this in hand, how you calculate the mean and how you calculate the variance. I threw in this expectation thing for kicks. There's nothing new here. It just says the expectation of x is that it'll be the mean. Okay. So to calculate the mean, what do we do? We take the probability function, which is this, and we multiply it by x. That's where the x comes in right there. And we integrate that from minus infinity to plus infinity. So because this is zero below minus one and zero above plus one, I just set the limits to be minus one and one, right? If you perform the integration, assuming I did this correctly, you'll get this here. And if you evaluate between the two limits, which there's another typo, isn't there? No, it's good. It's always just so far away I couldn't see. All right, so you evaluate between the two limits of plus one and minus one in this function. So first of all, everyone knows how to integrate that, right? And you evaluate the limits, you'll find that's zero, okay? So the mean of this distribution is zero, the true mean, okay? Soon I'll tell you what it means to take samples from a distribution and that, that generally won't be, well, I'll show you in a minute actually, that won't necessarily be zero. In fact, won't usually be zero. If I want to calculate the variance, then I take the function right there, I multiply it by x minus the mean, which I just computed to be zero, I square that thing, and then I integrate that between minus infinity to plus infinity, again, minus one to one. Good enough for here, all right? If you do that, you'll end up with this over here, unless I made a mistake, which I don't think I did. And if you evaluate the limits, you'll see this has a variance of 0.2, okay? So I mean, I'm assuming everyone knows exactly what the mean is. It's the average, right? So the variance, you, you should have some idea that the variance has something to do with the variability, let's say, about the mean, right? If this number is high, the probability of getting something far away from the mean is high. If it's small, the probability is low that you'll get something far away from the mean. So if I dare draw, you know what they say is that if you, if you, draw, if you draw and everything goes down, it means you're depressed. God help me. I mean, look at this. I feel good, but obviously something inside is not good. All right. So if we have a probability function, let's say I'm trying to draw a group of functions that all have the same mean, and that's meant to be one with a high variance, and this will be one with a a low variance, right? But the area has to be one, so this one has to high, have a higher peak, right? For this, so I'll have an area of one. So variance is some measure of the variability of 
of the random variable x. If it's high, variability is high. OK, so one last slide here, which I did for kicks. Um, I did this here, OK? So I said, I am taking n samples from a distribution. So I'll, have, I'll explain how I did this, but the main thing is the result. I used MATLAB, OK? And I used a normal distribution. So there's a function in MATLAB that computes everything you ever want to know about a normal Gaussian distribution, which we're going to focus on next time. It's got a function called random. It just randomly samples from the distribution. So it's not easy to write such a random func the function that does this. But so for example, if I were going to randomly sample from this one, I would randomly take points from here. But you know, it's more likely I'm going to get a sample from here than here because it's more probable. So you have to randomly sample according to the probability of events occurring or values occurring. So I use this function in MATLAB. Okay? But you can just think of it as data if you want. But because I did it in MATLAB, I know the true mean is 1 and true variance is a 4 because I, I, I specified it to be so. Okay? And then I took a group of samples, and from those samples, I calculated the mean and variance using those two equations. So you get the idea? I simulated an experiment. I simulated an experiment where I'm sampling from a distribution where I knew the mean and variance, which would be very unusual, but just to prove a point. Okay? And then for a different number of sample sizes, I calculated what the mean is, and I calculated what the variance was. Okay, and I know the true mean and true variance. So what is this telling you? Well, if you want the true mean and true variance, according to this example, you need a lot of samples, right? So you can see when I only had five samples. Also, by the way, if you have five samples, this is just luck. Sometimes you'll get a good five samples, to be honest with you, and the mean will be almost exactly uh, one. <laughs> it just, because when you do, f like if you do only five, um, randomness really is a big factor. If you do 10,000, randomness is just washed away by a huge number of samples. So in other words, if I did this five hundred times, I took five samples a hundred times and calculated the mean and variance, it would be all over the place. But if I did it with 10,000 samples, a thousand times, it almost all look exactly the same. Okay. So what this example is meant to show you is that if you increase the sample size, the sample mean starts to go look a lot like the true mean, which is what you expect, right? So the true mean of this from of this set of data, I know because I built I built the data set is one, and the true variance is is four. Okay. And the one thing you'll also learn it's not that clear from this data set, but Hopefully you can appreciate that if, if you want to calculate the average, like someone said, I want to calculate the average, hopefully you wouldn't say you need two samples, right? You know, it's kind of like, draw, I want to draw a straight line. You need two points, man. You know, how about 10 or 20 points would be better. So, but you can calculate usually a reasonable value, although this example, unfortunately, isn't illustrated that well. You can calculate the average with a fairly small number of samples and usually get a pretty good idea of the average. But if you want to calculate variability, you usually need a lot more samples. You'll learn that. Okay? So if someone just asks you, I want to know the average behavior of this, you might be able to do eight experiments. But if someone says, I really want to know how variable this process is, then you're going to need a lot more experiments, sometimes like an order of magnitude more. Okay? All right, so that's it. Thank you.